Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have the privilege of being joined by Dr. Raza Malek, who is the Director of Hepatology at Tufts Medical Center in Boston, and who will be talking about the need for a non-invasive tools and assessment for NAFLD NASH. Here is Dr. Malek. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining this webinar on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH. My name is Raza Malik. I'm a staff physician in hepatology and transplant hepatology in Boston, Massachusetts. I'd like to begin by talking to you about the epidemiology of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And as you can see from this initial slide, there's an epidemic in fatty liver as evidenced by non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH. And it's throughout the world. It's not just the developed countries of North America and Western Europe. It also includes Asia and also South America. And so throughout the world, the metabolic syndrome, which results in obesity, results in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is the umbrella term for fat deposition in the liver in the context of obesity and in the absence of alcohol use, and also the more severe form, which is NASH. And you can see that the prevalence in the United States is 10 to 40 percent and 3 to 5 percent of the U.S. population have the more severe form of NASH. And globally, an estimated 1 billion people have the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Also, in the right side of this panel, you can see that there's an increased incidence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and it's been rising steadily in this century. And the future implications for this, you can see with projected models going into 2030, show that there will be, continue to be an increased rise in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH. And this poses a significant burden to the US healthcare system. So as there will be an increase in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH, there'll be an increasing rise in advanced fibrosis, scarring in the liver, which will result in cirrhosis of the liver, and that will be associated with negative healthcare outcomes and also increasing burdens to the US health system. And this is outlined in this figure. The natural history of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is that an individual develops obesity, they develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with fat deposition in the liver. This can be characterized into two forms, the simple fatty liver, which is also known as non-alcoholic fatty liver, or also simple steatosis. In this cohort of patients, which overall accounts for 80% of patients, there's a low risk of progression in liver disease with advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. However, this is an important cohort that needs to be medically managed because they still have an increased cardiovascular mortality rate and a two to three fold increased risk of diabetes. 20% of the NAFL population can develop non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is the more severe form of NAFLD. And in these patients, they have an increased risk of cirrhosis and those increased risk of cirrhosis can result in liver decompensation with liver failure and also with hepatocellular carcinoma. And you can see that there's a 30% chance of liver failure and decompensation over eight years once you've reached cirrhosis in NAFLD. And also there's a 7% risk of hepatocellular carcinoma after 6.5 years. And if we look at the metabolic syndrome, which consists of abdominal obesity, hypertriglyceridemia, low HDL, hypertension, and insulin resistance and diabetes, which are the risk factors and which is the syndrome that results in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The factors that are associated with NASH in a variety of studies include advanced age, type 2 diabetes, female gender, his Hispanic ethnic origin, an AST ALT ratio of greater than 0 0.8, increased ferritin, and genetic factors including a PNP. LA3 phenotype. Going further into the pathogenesis, pathogenesis of non-alcoholic fatty liver and NASH, we can see from this figure at the bottom left that genetic factors play an important role. 
in the development of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And this combined with a Western lifestyle with a rudimentary lifestyle associated with a poor diet consisting of a high carbohydrate, high fat diet results in the deposition of fat in the liver and the development of hepatic steatosis. And then there's usually a second hit that results in NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And that comes from a combination of the hepatic steatosis and its interaction with an inflammatory pathway that has an impact with from the gut dysbiosis and the microbiome. So there's a complex interplay of genetic, environmental factors that result in initially hepatic steatosis and following that a second hit with oxidative stress that results in NASH that then results in hepatic fibrosis and progression in liver disease. So if we look at the histology of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we distinguish them as I've outlined earlier into either the more simple form, which is called simple steatosis or non-alcoholic fatty liver versus the more advanced form and progressive form, which is called NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So if we look at the bottom left side of this panel where you have simple steatosis, this is characterized by fat deposition in the liver. And that fat deposition in the liver can be seen throughout as macrosteatosis with large fat dropules throughout the liver. As you get progression in liver disease with the second hit that I described and you develop the more severe form of NASH, you can see it on the right side of the panel where you have NASH, you can see an increased number of mononuclear cells you can see hepatocyte ballooning, and so this is indicative of ballooning and lobular inflammation in addition to the hepatic steatosis that you see in non-alcoholic fatty liver and simple steatosis that results in the necroinflammation that's the more progressive form of NASH. And that more progressive form of NASH uh, increases your risk of developing hepatic fibrosis and that fibrosis can lead to cirrhosis. So at the bottom right of this panel, you can see the development from simple steatosis to steatohepatitis with the necroinflammation and hepatocyte ballooning, and that can progress all the way along to cirrhosis, and you can see the nodular architecture of the liver on this collagen staining that results in cirrhosis of the liver. And it's that cirrhosis that results in progression in liver disease and increases your risk of developing liver-related mortality. And the NASH fibrosis progression can be seen on this slide where once you develop cirrhosis of the liver, you have adverse outcomes, as can be seen on these Kaplan-Meier survival estimates, that as you develop cirrhosis, your survival goes down. And that is a result of liver failure and liver cancer associated with liver decompensation. On the right side of the panel, you can see how this fibrosis develops that results in cirrhosis. You can get initially an expansion of the portal tract. You then get this chicken wire periportal fibrosis and also centrolobular perisinusoidal fibrosis. That's the characteristic chicken wire appearance of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease fibrosis and that can progress all the way to the bottom panel to cirrhosis with nodule formation and an irregular architecture and irregular excess collagen deposition. I've described that you can get fat in the liver from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with the benign form called simple steatosis that can progress to NASH where you get necroinflammation and then that can progress to hepatic cirrhosis which can result in decompensation with liver failure and liver cancer. So throughout that spectrum, what we would like to do is to be able to grade and stage individuals' liver disease so that we can identify where along that spectrum and where along that line individual patients lie. And to date, the liver biopsy has been the standard of care to, uh, for us to grade and stage that liver disease. And so the liver biopsy allows us to grade the amount of inflammation 
and it allows us to stage the amount of fibrosis to be able to grade and stage the liver disease to see how advanced an individual patient's NAFLD has progressed to. But liver biopsy, which is an excellent test in terms of histological assessment of the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, has risk and complications. The most important of which includes bleeding, hematoma, infection, and perforation. And there is a morbidity and mortality associated with liver biopsy. And so, in addition to this, you can also get te a technical variability in terms of inter-observer variability, in terms of sampling bias that increases the risks and some of the interpretation issues of liver biopsy being a gold standard. Hence, over the last two decades, an alternative, non-invasive, accurate method for the assessment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has been sought. And this would allow individuals to grade and stage their liver disease in a non-invasive way without having to go through these risks that I've de described from liver disease from and liver biopsy. So in terms of non-invasive non markers, there's a variety of tools that are available. These include serum markers. Um, serum markers include biochemical markers, lipidomics, metabolomics, trans, transcriptomics, and we've also got imaging biomarkers and the combination of serum markers including both serum and imaging have also been used. So if we start off with non-invasive markers and laboratory serum markers, there's a number of different scores that have been used, including the FIB4 index, um, including the NAFL fibrosis score. And they look at a wide variety of parameters that include age, your AST, your ALT, your platelet count, your BMI, your albumin, and whether you have signs of insulin resistance. And we can see that uh, a number of these different uh, non-invasive markers have a variety of different AUROCs. So the FIB4 has an AUROC in the in this paper in a variety of different studies, but it outlined in this paper of 0 0.871. It has, you look at the AST to platelet ratio of 0 0.82, the NAFL fibrosis score at 0 0.86, the BARD score at 0 0.76. So you can see that most of these uh, non-invasive markers are running at about 0 0.75 to 0 0.875 in terms of their accuracy. And what we look for in terms of a test for achieving appropriate AUROC to be used as a non-invasive marker of liver fibrosis is we're looking for an AUROC of 0 0.9. So serum markers are good, but they don't seem to have achieved the full benchmark to be used as a non-invasive test for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They provide information that is accurate, but they haven't met the gold standard to date. We can look at non-invasive imaging markers that have been developed. So this is one where we look at the CAT-PRO on, on transient elastography. And one of the things that we would highlight is that transient elastography has been developed as a marker of liver fibrosis, uh, looking at the el elastograph profile throughout the liver and the addition of the CAP score at a later stage to assess the amount of hepatic steatosis uh, for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has been a late addition. So the CAP score in terms of assessing for the amount of NAFLD and fat presence in the liver has limited value. However, in terms of fibrosis assessment for transient elastography, the fibrosis assessment has been well validated with uh, FibroScan. However, the issue in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is that a number of the patients have a body mass index of greater than 30 and also a narrow intercostal space that reduces the sensitivity, specificity, and AUROC of transient elastography and FibroScan. And then that will result in inaccuracies 
in the test in this patient population of which a large proportion have, obese, have obesity. So as I've outlined, a number of these non-invasive markers have advantages and disadvantages. So if we look at the standard ultrasound versus vibration controlled transient elastography versus shear wave elastography versus MR elastography, there's advantages and disadvantages with each of these groups. Um, a, number of the, a number of these, especially if you look at MRI elastography, it's highly accurate. It's good at discriminating the degrees of fibrosis. However, there's issues around insurance approval, cost, lack of ability to do point of care testing, and the time taken for a test. So there's advantages and disadvantages with all these modalities in imaging. Some new technology that's coming out includes looking at uh, imaging with MRI and PDFF to look at the amount of steatosis, inflammation, ballooning and scarring. But again, the limitations with this type of technology is that it's costly. Few academic medical centers possess it. Insurance approval will be difficult and it will be time consuming and it won't therefore be have the ability to be a point of care test. Now, if we look at a number of the different imaging and serum markers, we can see that these non-invasive tests have a good ability to discriminate between cirrhosis and mild fibrosis, but they don't have the AUROC to be able to differentiate between different grades of fibrosis and the overall accuracy in the majority of these tests comes out at below 0 0.9 as I described which was the cutoff that we're looking for for a highly accurate test as a non-invasive marker in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if we do find a non-invasive marker for assessment of fatty liver disease an exciting development has been that you can assess and predict prognosis using that non-invasive marker and you can risk stratify your population of patients with that non-invasive marker, i.e. basing a liver stiffness reading, basing a hepatic steatosis reading, basing a serum fibrosis marker reading and using that to predict whether a patient will decompensate from their liver disease and therefore not just providing an estimate on hepatic fibrosis, but also providing an estimate on clinical parameters, including liver decompensation, and that's work in progress. So in conclusion, I'd like to let you know that there is an unmet need to develop a non-invasive test in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in NASH to assess the disease severity of an individual with this condition. Liver biopsy I've outlined is invasive and carries undesirable risks. Imaging tests are showing promise in achieving greater accuracy than serum markers as non-invasive markers in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. These non-invasive imaging tests will provide an alternative method to stage and stratify the liver disease in NAFLD in the future. The quantification of hepatic fat will play an important role as a non-invasive imaging test and there are exciting products in development currently. Finally, there are 50 NAFLD and NASH compounds in development, 34 of which are in phase 2 and 3, 4 of which are expected to be commercially available within 2 years. Hence it is important to identify a non-invasive imaging test that can stage an individual's liver disease prior to therapy and monitor the response to treatment when on a new therapeutic for NASH in the future. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.